Thank you all so much, and thank you folks for being here tonight. I appreciate it greatly. And uh, I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles, go to Acts chapter 2. We're studying Baptist heritage. And so we put it in focus last night. Say a Baptist is someone who believes the Baptist distinctives. Amen. And the six of them. And we started this morning, and we looked at the Baptist distinctive that the Bible is sole authority scripture. We looked at the Baptist distinctive of the independent church. Tonight, I want to talk about a regenerated church membership. Amen. Baptists believe you have to be born again yes. to be a member of the church. Yes. Methodists don't believe that. Presbyterians don't believe that. Lutherans don't believe that. Episcopalians don't believe that. None of the large segments uh, of what is called Christianity believe that besides Baptist and, and a segment maybe of the Pentecostals. It is a rare understanding, but it's a very, very important understanding. Uh, back when I was at down in Florida and had the privilege of being an administrator of Landmark Baptist College for 10 years, and uh, very shortly in that time, we moved to expand the college, and we uh, across the street there were five. Uh, there was a Presbyterian church with five buildings, and so we moved to purchase that. And we were just in the talking process, and we asked them, "Could we have a night to bring our church family over to see your facilities?" And we we got some of the college kids set up to give tours and so forth, and. Um, uh, I gave the tour to Pastor Carter's wife and to my wife as we went through the, the buildings wall unlocked and we're going through. We get to the auditorium and all across the back of the auditorium there was a banner. And that banner welcomed six names as new members of the church. And, and uh, my wife and Mrs. Carter were talking. I said, man, they really make a big... said, I've never seen a church make, make such a, a big deal out of new members. I said, you, you really kind of missed the story. Those are the six babies they baptized yeah. Yeah. last Sunday. And they became members of the church when they were baptized as babies. And uh, that makes a difference. In fact, it was interesting. We, we, had a, we ended up purchasing the property, and we had a long contract. and said that these are the items of furniture that they're taking. These are the items of furniture that they're leaving and all that. And so we had all that done, and they had started moving things out. And a couple of the Presbyterian men came to me and said, Oh, D Dr. String, p please don't hold us to that list. We forgot to put something on there. It's very, very important we have that. So said they'd forgot to put the baptistry on there. And they said most of our children were baptized in that baptistry. Now their baptistry wasn't like that baptistry. It looked like a bird bath, a little more ornate than the average bird bath. On the platform, they sprinkled folks with it. And they said most of our children were baptized out of that baptistry. And it's precious to us and we forgot to put it on the list. Please, please. Work. I said, you know, I don't think that's going to be a problem. I think you can take that. And it isn't going to disrupt anything. But... This truth is an important one. It is a truth in the explosion of uh, what are referred to as uh, non-denominational churches. Yeah. I refer to them as undefined Amen. churches. Amen. They have largely ignored this truth. And, and children are born into those churches. Most of them don't even have to be sprinkled. Children are born into those churches. And that is a very, very common procedure. And it's a dangerous one. Would you look, Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. Well, let's go back to verse 46. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now again, the concept of the church is an assembly. We talked about this this morning. It's the Lord's assembly. That very word in one place in the New Testament refers to Old Testament Israel, the church in the wilderness. But it still means assembly. It's not the same as a New Testament church, but it was an assembly in the wilderness of God's people. It was Old Testament Israel. Sometimes, I don't personally think many, it refers to all believers assembled together in heaven. Yes. 
I think there's about six examples of that in the New Testament. About 120 examples of the assembly, that's still an assembly, again, in heaven. That, that's still an assembly. General, general assembly and church of the firstborn yes. is an assembly. The word church means assembly. And, but I think 120 sometimes, it refers to local churches yes. just like this one. Yes. And it's very, very important uh, that this be understood, that God has a plan for the church today. Okay? And you have a whole lot of folks who believe that, uh, boy, since the Old Testament law has been done away with, we're now free and we have liberty to do anything we want because the Old Testament worship has been done away with. It is true Old Testament worship has been done away with. Okay? All the offerings, the sacrifices, the feasts, uh, many of the regulations are gone. I think I know, people debate it some, I think I know when that era was over. I believe that era was over when the veil holding the holy of, holies away from everybody after the death, death of Christ was rent in half from the top to the bottom. I think that ended the Old Testament law because now anyone could walk into the Holy of Holies. Okay. But that didn't end God having a plan for us. Right. Okay. And this is where people really get, get miss it. I uh, mentioned I go to the Philippines twice a year. I keep a very busy schedule, and, and boy, when I get a break from it, I'm just usually kind of exhausted, and I want to just flop and do nothing. But I was there a few years back, and some folks said, you have to go with us, you have to go with us. I said, tonight, I wasn't preaching anywhere. I said, why? I'd really rather. They said, no, you have to go with us. The worship dance team from an independent Baptist college in the United States was there in the Philippines. And they said, You've, we need you to come with us and see what this is. I didn't really want to. We went there. I sat in the back. I really didn't want anybody to know I was there. But unfortunately... The staff person in charge of the worship dance team recognized me. And uh, they got up and did traditional Filipino dances. And at the end, they all, all knelt, chanting, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That was it. Took two hours, but that was it. So afterwards, the the staff person in charge of the worship dance team came and said, Dr. Stringer, Dr. Stringer, what did you think? I didn't want to answer that question. And I actually tried to get out of it a little bit. He said, well, what did you think? I said, well, I caught the part that was dance. No question about that. There was a part that was dance. I, I didn't catch the part that was worship. And they said, oh, anything you do in the name of Jesus is worship. I said, you mean if we'd played basketball tonight and at halftime we'd all come down and got on our knees and chanted, Jesus, 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 that would be worship? They said, yes. Okay. Folks think that because Old Testament law is done away with, there's no such thing as New Testament worship, but there is. Yes. It's the Great Commission. God has replaced Old Testament worship with a very simple command repeated four times in the scripture that the local church says go ye ye is a plural word lots of people don't get this pronouns that start with a t and a y like the and thou and ye bother a lot of people they say we don't they've missed those all have a meaning yeah. Yeah. any personal pronoun with a t is a singular word right. any personal pronoun with a y is a plural word and folks go to the Great Commission, they say, well, this given individuals or to the church? Go ye. Yes. Plural. It's something we're supposed to be doing as a body, as a group. It's a command for us to work together. Say, well, I, I, I just serve the Lord out at the crank bank on Sunday. No, you don't. You go fishing on Sunday. It doesn't have anything to do with serving the Lord. Serving the Lord in the New Testament dispensation is the Great Commission. Our working together as an assembly to carry out the instructions to win people to Christ, and that's for all nations. 
Sometimes folks miss the Great Commission because they're very busy reaching their people for the Lord. White people, black people, Hispanics. I was preaching in a large Hispanic church in, in Dallas area and a missions conference, and I noticed every one of their missionaries was to the Spanish-speaking world. And I did not plan to say this. Sometimes when you're a preacher, things pop out that you did not plan. So, sometimes you say something, did, did I really just say that? <laughs> I didn't mean to. I didn't plan this. It just came out. I said, that's not missions when you're only going to your own people. Missions is when you have a burden for the whole world. Afterwards, I apologized to the pastor. I had, hadn't, like I said, I hadn't planned to do that. And so they asked me to come back for missions conference the next year. I was a little surprised, to be honest with you. When I came back, they had missionaries to Russia, and they had missionaries to France, and they, had, they got it. Okay. Missions is when you're looking at the whole world. Amen. Go ye, whole world, it's taking the gospel, it's training people then to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you and baptizing people. Okay? The Great Commission is the gospel, baptism, the picture of the gospel, and training people in the Word of God. That's what we do for New Testament worship. Amen. There was nothing like this in the Old Testament when we got together as a group and took the message to people. I believe there were some non-Jews converted in the Old Testament time, but it was not because anybody went and knocked on their door. The message was still there. And there, there, you, you had, comparatively, considering the whole nation, you had a small number of priests compared to the number of pastors that we have today. God has divided us up in assemblies to carry out his worship today. And his worship today is not the offerings, it's not the sacrifices. It is preaching the gospel, baptizing folks to get saved, and training people in the word of God. That is New Testament worship. Amen. And in the course of this, as folks got saved, they were added to the church. Why weren't they in the church before they got saved? Because being born again is a requirement for church membership. Amen. Now, this is very important. We, we mentioned this, I, th I don't know if it was this morning. Yeah, we mentioned it last night. I think Martin Luther, at least in the beginning, really preached the gospel. Lots of folks got saved. I have sermons of his in which the gospel is clear. But within a generation, the Lutheran church is not standing for that, at least the majority of them. I think John Wesley preached the gospel, maybe not as clearly as he could have on every point, but enough that a multitude of people got saved. Within a generation, I mean, he's preaching to people that are in the Church of England about salvation. That's why they weren't very happy with him. He writes in his journal that he... he uh, He'd come back from the colonies in which he got saved on the trip. He'd come back from the colonies and they'd set him up. He was going to preach in this church of England, this church, one after another church of England. And he said, he began to preach the gospel and give an invitation for salvation. And he's telling the story. He said, I went there, I preached the gospel. This many people got saved. I was told I was never to come back there again. And he went to the next one, preached the gospel. Folks got saved. And the leadership of that just said, you're never to come back here again. I mean, he made an impact preaching the gospel, an impact he had along with George Whitfield that would stir two continents. And he was preaching the gospel. And, and in contrast to the work salvation that was being presented in much of the Church of England. Within a generation, the Methodist Church is teaching work salvation. It didn't last. See, why in the world didn't it last? Neither Luther nor Wesley believed in a regeneration church membership. The first members of the churches that came out of their preaching were saved people. But their children were automatically church members. So within a generation, if you were a Lutheran pastor, in a generation, if you were a Methodist pastor, you were pastoring a church where a number of the members weren't saved. You pastors know what it's like pastoring saved people and keeping right. things straight. How would you like to pastor lost people and try and keep things straight? 
And uh, you had a percentage. And when I say they're members of the church, I don't mean they were just that they were attending. That's fine. It's wonderful to have lost people attending our services. We love it. Chance to go. I'm talking about they were members. They had a vote. They could serve in offices. They could teach. And, and uh, they could do all kinds of things. And the spirit of these lost people changed the spirit of those evangelistic churches. Within a generation. They came up in the congregational church with something they called the halfway covenant. Because they said, this is a problem. We have lost people as deacons and lost people. And they said, well, here's the thing. He said, you can be a member of the church, but you can only do these certain things. You can't do these things till after you're born again. It was an attempt to solve a problem, but it was a non-biblical attempt to solve a problem. And it didn't work. Because the members who weren't allowed to do this and this and this were upset about it. And they maneuvered and changed. Long story short, halfway covenant blew up and didn't accomplish anything. It is a vital truth that in order to be a member of the church, you have to be born again. Yeah. And it's always a question. How, how, do, how do we know that? And we never know 100%. We only do the best we can. We never know 100%. Different churches have different ways. When I pastored in Chicago, it was already in the church constitution that a person has to give their salvation testimony to the pastor and satisfy the pastor they understand. I've known a lot of churches where folks would just come forward and pray with somebody at the altar and, and they'd be voted in membership of the church. You couldn't do that in the church I pastored in Chicago. You had to have a meeting with the pastor and give the pastor your testimony. The other churches, it's the pastor and the deacons. Other churches, you have to give your testimony to the whole church. Now that frightens some people. Our church is kind of interesting. We have a television ministry and we have a recording studio and all that. At our church, you give your testimony in the recording studio to the pastor and it's played to the church. You're not actually standing in front of them when it's played. And that the congregation has an opportunity to respond to your testimony. And I, I can promise you, anybody goes in a recording studio and, and, and their, their message is not clear, uh, that, that doesn't get played. You know, right. They work on that until it's taken care of. And uh, I had folks, and I was warned about this right away when I started pastoring in Chicago. And they said, uh, well, you've got somebody, uh, transvestite that's going to demand to be considered for church membership. So they've all told us. So that's fine. I said that constitution says you have to give your testimony to the pastor. The pastor has to make a recommendation to the church. Came, gave a testimony to me. I got up and recommended that the church not accept them for membership. Passed unanimously, by the way. If you'd seen the person, you would have clearly understood and uh, they said, well, they, they might sue. They might. But save people are what gets added to the church. And while we cannot be 100% sure, it is our obligation to do the best we can. <laughs> different churches, again, develop different methods for, for how to handle that do the best we can part. And every situation is not the same. And, and uh, I grew up in churches where all you do is give your testimony to a personal worker at the altar. Boy, if that was ever a wise thing, it's not a wise thing today. Like I said the church I pastored already had it put in the Constitution because they'd had to deal with this kind of thing so many times. You gave your testimony to the pastor, and the pastor could ask, and you had to satisfy the pastor, and he had to make the recommendation to the church. I've heard Mr. Jones's testimony. And I, I believe he's given a good testimony about understanding salvation, having trust the Lord. I recommend we accept him as a church member. Or I say, he's given a testimony about baptism. I recommend we accept him as a church member. Or I said, he hasn't been baptized yet. I recommend we accept him as a church member as soon as he's baptized. Okay. This is an important Bible truth. Now, I will tell you. Some of the, the undefined churches are booming today. Largely, they're booming because folks are leaving independent Baptist churches and going to them. That's just reality. 
but they are having some people that make professions of faith. I'm glad for anybody to get saved wherever they get saved at, whatever the circumstances. Some of them are preaching the gospel. Some of them are preaching the gospel sort of fuzzy. Some of them are preaching it pretty clear. Some of them got it all messed up. Some of them aren't going to let you know what they think about it because very simple people ask why they want to be undefined. I can answer that very simply. They want Pentecostal money in the offering plate. They want Methodist money in the offering plate. They want Baptist money in the offering plate. And for some of them, they're making that really work for them. But here is, there are a number of dangers to this movement. And this is one of them. When you're trying to be all things to everyone, you want to take stand on as few issues as possible. You are trying to draw everybody into membership without any change in their understanding of things. So you don't tell anybody they can't join. You certainly don't tell them their children cannot be members. And, and so very few of these churches have any conception of a regenerated church membership. That's not how you make everybody happy. Okay? Uh, some of them don't do any screening at all because it doesn't fit with their program. I can tell you the word of God repeatedly warns us about this principle that unsaved people will try to get into the church. Would you look with me in some places? Look at Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Say, but, but we'll offend people. I don't like offending people. Genuinely, I don't. I, I like losing the church even less. Acts chapter 20, verse 28 and 29. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Yeah. You mean with pastors. Saying you're going to have people try to come in and be part of the church, right. be part of the flock. Right. This is given as a warning. Some lost people might try to join the church not knowing what they're doing. But others will come very much on purpose for they're looking for a place where they can influence people. Right. The Christian identity cult has virtually been built on having, and they will tell their people, that you don't need a separate church. Stay in the church you're at, the people, and spread the good word there. Last act, pastored a church in Marion, Indiana, before I went to Florida, down to Landmark Baptist College, my last Sunday. We had a couple that had been coming, and they would come to church, and they would pass out Christian identity materials. And I would say, you cannot do this here. That, that's unbiblical, it's unscriptural, uh, and you cannot pass that material out at this church. And, and so they moved to the back. And they'd pass them out during the service, and they figured I couldn't see them from the platform, which wasn't true. So I stopped them again. And now it's my last Sunday. So they figured they can get away with anything on my last Sunday. So they tried doing that on my last Sunday, and they're passing out materials during the service while I'm preaching. I had the ushers take them out. Okay? That, attending the services never bothered me. But they did not have any right to be church members. Right. Ironically enough, the very next Sunday, I'm in Florida, and, and uh, my family's joining Landmark Baptist Church, and the same thing happened at Landmark, and Pastor Carter had to have people taken out. I, I mean, the Bible warns us about this. This is not new. In early Christianity, when the local churches begin to boom, false teachers begin to call themselves Christian, and they begin to produce corrupted copies of the Bible. Paul warns about it to Corinthians. And they begin to produce corrupted copies of the Bible so they could call themselves Christian and teach what they wanted to teach. And that is where our Bible debate of today comes from. Those corrupted copies that were made by false teachers that wanted to be considered Christians. We cannot tell people in other churches whether they can call themselves Christian or not. But we can certainly 
be clear about what's done in our churches and might be. I pastored in Chicago, about two blocks down the street. There's a church, the name on it said it was the Community Christian Church. I did not know what that was. One day, I saw somebody going to the church. I stopped, I introduced myself, wanted to find out what the Community Christian Church was all about. Man, oh man. I, I found out they were a, a uh, church that believes in the communion of the saints. That is a belief that when people die, their spirits do not go to eternity right away. They stay on this earth, and they stay in communion with people. And they believe, and I'm talking to the pastor, and he said, yeah, yeah. He said, oh, the departed saints come and worship with us on Sunday morning. And he said, our international seminary is right across the street from your church. We know where it's at. I said, so there's nothing across the street from our church any direction except apartment buildings. They said, the one to the north is our international seminary. There was no sign. But they had kids that came from around the world there in order to train they said they would train them how to communicate with the spirits of the preborn and the spirits of the dead and one one week we're having a revival meeting and some of the young ladies that went to that seminary uh were out sitting on the deck very attractive young ladies and, and a couple of my young men came up they had no idea what the place was and they said pastor would there be anything wrong with us going and inviting them to church I said, your deep abiding burden for the souls of attractive young women is very impressive. <laughs> I said, no, you go right ahead and invite, go over and invite them if you want to. And they did. They came back, their eyes were wide like this. So they said, what is that? Who are they? So I could have told them, but I didn't feel like it. <laughs> A regenerated church membership. We cannot keep other people from calling themselves Christians even though they know nothing about salvation. Yeah. So my, my founder of the church I'm a member of was saved as United Methodist pastor. He got a job as United Methodist pastor at, when he was a student at University of Kentucky. And he said he'd make more money at that than any other part-time job he knew about. That's why he was the pastor. So a couple of guys at school found out he was a pastor. They said, well, we want to go to church with you. And so they went with him. And they heard him preach and they came back and they said, you really don't know anything about salvation, do you? And they witnessed to him and led him to Christ. That was great. He didn't last as United Methodist pastor very long after that. And they all, all three of them ended up going to Bible college together after that. And are in, were in the ministry a long time. Dr. Scudder's with the Lord now. One of the other two is, but the other one's still a pastor in Texas. And... Uh, but, but this thing about a regenerated church membership is critically important, which is why the Lord warns about it over and over again. Would you look at 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1? One of the interesting things about pastoring in Chicago that, that I'd never experienced before was the folks that would show up at your church on an almost daily basis. Interesting folks. 2 Peter 2.1, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, bring upon themselves swift destruction. You don't believe the number of people showed up at church in Chicago, said the Lord led me here to speak today, or the Lord led me here to join your church, or the Lord wants me to be a teacher in your church, or the Lord wants me to sing in your church, and, and God sent me here today. I would say, no, he didn't. I'm the pastor. He'd have told me first. And I mean, I had to deal with this all the time. And some of them were big time crazy. Uh, but but therefore, they, they would have been thrilled to have a church that would have accepted them. That they could be part of. That is the one. So the, he didn't say that there might be. He said, even as there shall be false teachers among you, you have to be aware of this all the time. Even after we have done everything we can do, some of them will slip past our screening. Yeah. And then we have to be willing to deal with them because it's extremely important we do not have unsaved church members. Yeah. I can go on. There are a number of other passages in Scripture. Look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 22 through 26.
Ah, that's not what I want to read. Chapter 22. Chapter 2, we'll pick up verse 22. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is Christ? He is Antichrist, he that denieth the Father and Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. He that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you which you have heard from the beginning. If that which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye shall also continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he hath promised us even in eternal life. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. So I'm just clarifying again, the gospel begins with an acceptance of Jesus as the Christ. Yep. He said, some people will try to seduce you from that. He said, I'm warning you about those people. And uh, it, it, it gets to be amazing. I, had, I took a church, I started to pastor a church, and, and uh, very quickly found out we had a Sunday school teacher that didn't believe in hell. And so I sat down to talk with him. See, you cannot teach this here. And as I went on, I found he didn't believe in personal salvation either. I mean, how in the world did he get to be a member of the church? He actually joined in a time when the previous pastor was critically ill. And somehow managed to slip past the process during that time. But he wanted to be in that church. And he wanted to be teaching a Sunday school class in that church. It, it is face all time. There are many passages, just one more, Jude, verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares. They got in, folks didn't know. They were getting in. They didn't know what they were getting. Because they didn't show up and advertise what they were all about and what their agenda was. There are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They, they crept in. That is a challenge we face. If you invite everybody into your membership, they don't have to creep in. Yep. It becomes pretty easy. Right. And you don't have grounds for dealing with them after you realize what they are. Right? The ones that creep in, you can address when you become aware. And I had a man who joined a, our church and he came in, said he got saved during... Um, one of our services, and that's fine. We're glad for that. He knew all the right words to say, join the church. And the next thing I knew, he was holding Bible studies at his house without checking with me. And during those Bible studies, and he's all inviting people he knew from the church, I only found out about it because his next door neighbor lived in an apartment building. His next door neighbor uh, called me and said, do you know what he's doing in your name? I don't have an idea. He told me. He said, you know he's collecting their tithes. It's simpler. You can just tithe at Bible study. Rather than get, turn in at church. Now, I'll let you guess how much of that money the church had ever seen. Yeah. That was it. And, and his next door neighbor said, I don't think this is the first church that he's done that in. He learned what to say. Well, I didn't know, and he slipped past the process, but soon as I knew about it, I sat down and talked with him, and then I went to our church family, and I told them what happened, and we voted him out of the church membership. You cannot afford to have lost people in the membership of the church. Now, what happens if you do? Have you ever asked yourself, how many church buildings do we drive by that when that church was started, it was started by people that least loved the Lord if they didn't understand everything doctrinally they should have. You should try Chicago. 1950s. Chicago was the heart of the Bible church movement. And, and there were pre uh, uh, preeminent Bible churches all over Chicago. They would have national meetings there. And, and just all over the place, 
There were these churches, they did preach the gospel, etc. But they weren't Baptists. Never regenerated church membership. I had a family in the church that lived across the street from a, a church, a people's church in Chicago. And uh, when, when they came out of church one Sunday night and their car wouldn't start and I ran them home and it ran them home as, as the people's church was getting out. People's church had been a famous church. Back in the 1950s, they held sword conferences there with leading preachers in the fundamentalist movement. And uh, I, I managed to get them there as church was letting out. Today, that's a homosexual church. I'm betting that didn't happen overnight. They got some lost people in there. And they moved it a little bit. And then he moved it a little bit more. Then he moved it a little bit more. And he moved it a little bit no more. Until half century later, it stood for everything the exact opposite of what it had been in its heyday. Another church, large church in Chicago. I, I, I drove by it and I said, I, I, you know, I think I've heard of that. And it was, a, a, on, according to the sign, uh, you know, it was a church. I, I looked it up and sure enough, it, it was a church. They'd had big Bible church meetings in Chicago. Had a 1,400-seat auditorium. And I thought, boy, I'd like, like to meet those folks. One day I saw some folks going in and I stopped and I introduced myself. And they took me in. They showed me this historic auditorium where all these things happen. They said, we don't have services here anymore. They took me to an auditorium about half the size of one half of your auditorium. They're running 30. Older folks who just, not, just didn't want to give up on the church where they'd seen God work at one time. I said, what happened? Oh, they said, we had so many different groups infiltrate this church when it was up at the top, when it was at its height, when it ran over a thousand every Sunday. They said, we had so many different groups infiltrate this church and, and, and they'd drive a few people off and this group would drive a few people off and then these two groups would fight. And, and, they, and uh, they told me this for a while and I said, could I ask you something? I said, your doctrinal statement. I said, did you require folks to be born again to be members of the church? No. They, in effect, invited the whole community in. Yeah. Guess what they got? A 1,400-seat auditorium with 30 people. Didn't pay to ever turn the lights on in the auditorium. And say that was probably 15 years ago I was in there. And uh, all the folks I talked to, I suspect, aren't around now. What happens if we do not follow this Baptist distinctive? Okay. One of the most famous gospel preaching churches in England became a Jehovah's Witness congregation. The Jehovah's Witnesses found out they had open membership. Anybody could be a member without any qualifications, and the Jehovah's Witnesses infiltrated it till they ended up getting control of it, and they got this incredible auditorium in London for the Jehovah's Witness movement. Way back still when Charles Taz Russell was alive. And they had, as Pastor Russell, as they call him, founder of Jehovah's Witness, they, they brought him over to England to preach there. What happens if you do not follow this Baptist distinctive? Your church dies. Okay. Got a guarantee of it. You might be surprised how quickly yep. it would die. Yep. You can drive through Indianapolis and look at church building after church building where a modernist gospel is preached today, false gospel, or where no gospel of any kind is preached because it's closed, and they're, they're buildings where there was a church that was established by saved people. But they didn't maintain this. And the unsaved got hold of it. I went to Chicago and I knew the south side of Chicago. My church was on the north side. Uh, the south side of Chicago was a war zone. 
All of Chicago is a war zone now. But when I pastored there, it wasn't. The south side was. And I was burdened for the south side. We, we had a few folks that we met that got saved and were coming to our church from the south side. And I was burdened for it. I said, we need to do something. We need to start a church down there or something. So I started spending Wednesdays, Wednesdays on south side Chicago. Here is what stunned me. There's a Baptist church on virtually every block. I never saw so many Baptist churches in my entire life. And no influence of the gospel there. And we would pass out scripture portions door to door. We passed out over a million of them on South Side Chicago. During that time, we found one independent Baptist church. Frankly, we're kind of shocked. We're just going door to door. So their sign says, independent fundamental. Hmm. Pastor and I became good friends. I had him preach for me, tremendous preacher. And I preached for him, and we had great time. But, but the only one of those Baptist churches I found that was really preaching the gospel. We went to one church, and we just went by one church. pastor was coming out. The name of the church was Paradise Missionary Stranger Baptist Church. Stop, talk to pastor for a minute. He said, look, he said, Saturday, that we're having a preacher's meeting here at the church. Would you like to come preach for us? Sure. So I was there Saturday. Didn't know what I was getting into. I asked him. I got to ask. I, I got to ask you. How did you get this name? He said nobody knows. Church is over a hundred years old. Nobody here has any idea how the church got that name. I tried to look it up in the internet and found several mentions of the church, but no explanation of how it got that name. Paradise Missionary Stranger Baptist Church. There are churches everywhere there. Many of them had Wednesday morning services because it wasn't safe to be out at night. And most of the folks were welfare folks, and so they were free during the day. And, and I started attending some of those services just to get acquainted with those folks. Nobody was preaching the gospel to people. All a social gospel. All works. I'm promising you those Baptist churches were not started by people that believed those things. They were started by people that believed the Baptist distinctives, that had a vision and a burden, but somewhere along the way, they gave that up. Couple cases, I did have people tell me. Said, well, the, the church got smaller and weaker and the congregation got older and they just needed all the help they could. So they just started taking anybody. And the nature of the church was destroyed. And it was no longer a real Baptist church, no matter what the name said. If you don't keep this Baptist distinctive, you do not have to wonder what the price is going to be. Right. Drive around Indianapolis, you find endless examples of it. Drive around Chicago, you find even more examples of it. I was naive when I went there. I thought because Southside Chicago was a war zone, wicked, and godly, it's because there weren't churches. Man, was I wrong. There were churches everywhere. And I suspect many of them had been started by godly people who wanted to preach the gospel there to that multitude of people. But they didn't maintain this. And they weren't preaching the gospel. And my heart broke over and over and over again when I found out what churches were actually preaching and actually doing with the one exception. And he told me, and I got acquainted with him, he said, this is what you're going to find. This is what's here. You don't maintain this. We lose it all. Yeah. So that's great. We've got that right now. And that's wonderful. But let me tell you what's happening all over the United States. I, I, I preach every week somewhere. I've preached in 49 states. I'm not trying to say I'm an expert, but I have seen some things. The, our average age of our congregation is getting older and older and older. And as that happens, churches get more and more desperate for new members. And in desperation for new members... They get less and less careful. I talked with a church and 
they, they'd let a lady join the church that's not saved and they really didn't want her, uh, you know, they didn't want to cross that line, but they hadn't had a piano player in two years and she's a really good piano player and they needed a piano player really bad. I promise you how that ends. They'll be missing more than a piano player. Okay? You, you all understand that why this is so critically important. You practice the Baptist distinctives. Bible is our sole authority. Independent, autonomous church with New Testament worship, the Great Commission. A regenerated church membership, and then the ones we'll look at tomorrow, separates the church and state, believers' baptism and Lord's Supper, and the priesthood of believers. If we practice those things, God has a reason to bless us. To make sure we always give God a reason to bless us. Yes. I'm not telling you things are going to be easy. Baptists were booming in the 50s, 60s, and 70s in this country. They're not booming right now. They're challenges. It may very well be some of our churches are going to have to swallow their pride and merge with one another. That may very well be true. There may be things that have to be looked at and changed. But glory to God... As long as we're following these basic truths, we're giving God a reason to bless Amen. us. Yeah. Turn away from them. I would drive by the People's Church in Chicago fairly often going here or there places. Every time I look at that building where John R. Rice preached and Bob Joe Sr. preached. I just shake my head. What, what a tragedy that is. Yeah. But if you don't maintain this truth. And I am grateful for everybody that preaches the gospel. I'm grateful anytime anybody gets saved anywhere. It thrills me. Okay. I ran across some folks, some unusual folks that I wouldn't have guessed were saved in Chicago. That, but the, that gave testimony to the gospel. I'm glad anytime anybody gets saved, anywhere, in any setting, in any situation, I'm glad for it. But these truths don't matter. Okay. What's accomplished through the ministry of winning souls, it's wonderful every time somebody gets saved. But what's accomplished will be gone in a generation if you don't practice these truths. So people ask me, about the Asbury Revival and that kind of thing. I don't know any specific details about that, but I do know this. Um, I, and I've heard a lot of other things, but I do know this. You said, boy, it's a stirring revival. Yeah, are those folks that end up in Baptist churches? The answer is absolutely not. Okay. Some of the leadership is preaching accepting homosexuality. They're not ending up in Baptist churches. Is any good thing happening in the hearts of anybody? I, I don't know. Maybe it is. I think it does demonstrate that there's still a hunger among young people for the things of the Lord when we've been told there isn't. But what any good that's being done there, gone in a generation. And the bad that's being done there, the bad lasts longer. People ask me about this movement or that movement. Are folks ending up in churches that teach these truths? E even if it is a work of God, and the gospel saves people, even when it's preached by people that have misunderstandings, the gospel saves people. Yeah. Glory to God. The gospel is powerful. Yes. It's wonderful. I rejoice when somebody gets saved. But without these truths, it'll be lost in the next generation. Yeah. Okay. And we've had an incredible amount of evangelism in the United States to end up where we are as a country today. Because what was done was lost in the next generation. And it's still happening. Okay. Uh, these truths are important. And church has to be conscious of them. We've got to teach them. We've got to stand for them. And we've got to practice them because they work. God bless you all. Let me say something tonight. We, we have four churches represented here this evening. We have Clinton Road uh, in uh, Lake Zurich, Illinois. 
We have True Light from Liston, we have Brownsburg Baptist representative and Hope Baptist Church. Uh, let's take a few minutes here, here, please, this evening, and let's just come down here to the front and pray for our churches. I, I think this evening that would be a good thing to do after this message. Listen, the devil wants nothing more than to run wolves into the church and absolutely destroy it. And man, as Dr. Stringer shows tonight, it's working across the country. So let's stand to our feet. The altar's open now. Would you come? Find a place and pray for your church. Pray for these churches. Pray for our church this evening, that God would have his hand upon us and protect us from the wolves and the weasels that come to destroy it. <laughs> 